Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 131, The Jackie Piper Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we take another lap around the rink, hear the incredible hockey life of our next guest, Jackie Piper, and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com that's SweetHockeyCoach.com and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today, I'm excited to hear my next guest, Jackie Piper's Hockey Journey. I was introduced to her from a mom of a player I train, who loves the podcast, by the way, and said Jackie would be an awesome guest on the show, so here we are. Jackie Piper made it to the top of the mountain, having the dream of one day playing college hockey, and I want to know how she did it. We'll start at the beginning and go back to where this young hockey hopeful was guided early on by her mother, who had a passion for the sport and passed that love on to her kids. However, like every hockey journey, there are some dark and challenging times, and this was something the whole Piper family would have to collectively go through and band together as one unit, as one of their team members, Duke, her older brother, at the age of 15, was told he had a 5% chance to live. Jackie Piper's contributions to the sport of hockey didn't end once she hung up the competitive skates for good. She's been guiding the next generation of hockey greats, coaching at various levels over the years, and currently doing private small group on-ice skills training most mornings before she heads to the other passion she has, and that's helping others again as a speech pathologist. If you're ready to get inspired, well, grab your water, cup of tea or coffee, and let's settle in to a story that is sure to pull on the heartstrings a little bit. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Jackie Piper to the show. Jackie, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, excited about it. Uh, I was training uh, someone that we both train. The mom said she'd be a cool guest to have on the show, and uh, here we are. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time, and I, I, I really look forward to, to hearing uh, your story. Uh, and I know my listeners are going to enjoy it as well. So how I like to start all the shows where I'm interviewing someone is I'd like to rewind the tape. And let's take a moment, look in the rearview mirror, and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Jackie Piper. Yeah, so I um, grew up in Egan, Minnesota, and hockey was a huge, well, skating was a huge part of my childhood as my mom um, has been a skating coach and a figure skating coach her entire life. And my dad played hockey and football at Ohio State. And so basically my daycare, as you would say, was going to the rink with my mom and she just tied skates on my brother and I and was more like fend for yourselves. I got a coach. (laughs) Um, and her biggest thing, cause my dad really wanted my older brother to play hockey and my mom said, okay, that's fine. But both of the kids are going to learn how to skate before they touch a sticker puck. So my first couple of years of skating, and I started skating when I was two years old. So right away threw skates on me and I, yeah, I, I lived at the rink. Um, and of course I wanted to keep up with my brother. So I was, you know, constantly just trying to race him and 
we started in figure skates because that was my mom's big thing is that they are going to learn how to use their edges. They're going to learn how to stay strong on their skates. And so my brother and I were both in figure skates and we did ice shows together for a couple of years. Oh, and no then, way. yeah. And then my brother decided to play hockey. And of course, me looking up to him wanted to follow in his footsteps. And so about four, I told my mom that I did not want to be in figure skates anymore. I wanted hockey skates. And so that kind of started my hockey journey. Yeah. And so right away, um, first couple of years, just skating. Then finally, I was able to actually play hockey. And I was on my brother's team for a little bit, which he did not like. (laughs) Mm. But... My dad was just kind of like, oh, if, you know, Duke's team needs a sub, Jackie will do it. And I loved it right from the beginning. Um, Then we kind of took hockey more seriously. And I always played up when it came to hockey. Um, I kind of skipped mites and all of that and went right into U10s. For so Egan. you were playing you were playing girls hockey then, not boys? So I did both. Okay. So I for my youth for U tens it was girls, but then in the summer and spring it was with boys. So I got a good mixture of it. And my dad really wanted me to keep playing boys. I more wanted to be with my friends and yeah, yeah. play with the girls. And then even throughout my entire career. I continued to do private lessons for skating. So once we got into grade school and a little bit older, my brother would, um, before school, have skating lessons with Andy Ness, and my mom would hop on the ice with me and coach me for a bit. And so those morning skating lessons has been a huge, huge impact and a reason that I have decided to continue um, private lessons as a coach because I just know how beneficial it is as a hockey as a hockey player. Um, and so once this was, you know, around like third grade, my parents decided to move, and so we moved to Edina, and I absolutely <laughs> I love Edina so. <laughs> My whole family, we were super excited about it. And I'm extremely thankful that I did go to Edina and because I had one of the most amazing youth coaches and what truly, I think, set me in the right path to play Division I hockey and to reach the goals that I did was because of my youth coach on top of my private lessons. So, and who was that? Dean Williamson. And we have and, a connection there because yep. because I lived with Dean my what was it sophomore year at the University of Minnesota we played together. And oh, did then, you? Yep, yep. And then I've I've known Taylor obviously forever and uh, worked with her a little bit. So there's a little connection there. Hey, yeah. before you go on, I want to uh, just ask one quick question that. Um, you know, because you were at the rink all the time, you you had that luxury, which most kids don't, you know, mm-hmm. that you got the, all that extra ice time on top of doing the privates, uh, stuff like that. Did you have much outdoor time during the winters? And did you do any, like, did you have a place at home to shoot pucks and do some stick handling stuff? No. So we never had it. I mean... We never had a spot really to do much off ice. Um, I'm going to be honest. I was never the kid to shoot pucks in the garage. And I know I get a lot of um, faces when I say that, but I could probably count on my hand how many times I went outside and shot pucks. (laughs) Um, Yes. I spent a lot of my free time when I wasn't on the ice doing other sports. 
my parents did throw my brother and I into anything really we wanted. So I played basketball, soccer, track, um, literally anything. We skied a lot in the winter. So we were very active. So when I was on the ice, it was very hockey focused and skating focused. But once I was done with practice, I was kind of took a break from hockey. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. You multi-sport athlete. Um, yep. Let's go back to our buddy Dean Williamson. Um, he he seemed to have made a heck of an impact on you. Talk a little bit about that. How did he change your kind of trajectory? Yeah, looking back at um, the coaching that I got from Dean, I think it's very rare to find youth coaches in today's hockey world that are like Dean Williamson. And he not only he I mean he was my youth coach for almost every year, but he also would have in the summer morning ice for us to work on stick handling for an hour. And so he would invite around five or eight of us Edina players and we would learn how to stick handle, learn how to deke. And so what really I believe set him apart as a coach is because he worked on those specific skills at a young age. You know, this was when I was in U10s, U12s. And I learned all of those kind of fundamental skills that I think a lot of kids look past. And in the youth, we didn't just work on regrouping and, you know, forecheck. He really took the time to work on, you know, pinching, how to play D, how to deke, you know, what your whole body should be looking like. And so those little details is what really set me apart as a player on top of my skating ability, because that is, was for sure my strong, strong suit. I could skate. And then, you know, I had Dino on top of that really teach me how to deke. And I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't by far the best stick handler, but I could deke. And I think because he really took the time to teach me how to transfer my weight from one skate to the other as I'm pulling the puck across, how the puck should be pulled across, you know, not an angle. It's got to go all the way. When you go to your backhand, you want it to be, you know, your full extension, have just your top hand. So he really took the time with all those little things and we worked on it. And, you know, without that lesson, I don't really know where else I would have been taught those little things. And I just think he was a phenomenal coach in general. His drills were great. He did give us stick handling homework. And I'm sorry, Dean, if you're listening, I didn't quite probably do it as much as you wanted me to, but he just had those, he gave us those fundamental skills that some youth kids miss. And I'm seeing that right now as I coach these privates and work with them, they're missing some of these little fundamentals. A lot of kids don't know how to deke. And they don't know kind of how your head needs to move with your body because that defenseman is looking at your chest. So your upper body needs to move, not just the puck. And just those little things like that. Um, You know, I I give all the credit to Dean there for that. So you all of a sudden are – now, were you – was Taylor Williamson, was you you and her – kind of grow up together there? Yeah, we okay. were teammates throughout basically our whole childhood with soccer as well. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I mean, you got two kids that are really competitive, like a healthy, healthy competition, and that's uh, that's a good little formula. So when, you know, things are changing for you, when did you have the ignition or the moment where, you know, like, I want to see how good I can be at this sport and maybe play college hockey? When did that happen? Um, I knew I was always pretty good. Um, 
basically kind of in U tens because you know as a first year U10, there was only me and two other girls that made the A team. And so you kind of got that realization like, okay, you're good. But I, growing up, was always torn between soccer and hockey. I would go back and forth between wanting to play college soccer or college hockey. And then it really took an injury my eighth grade year that I decided, okay, soccer is not for me. I'm going to kind of stick with hockey. And also Taylor and I, we would constantly be missing winter soccer practice for hockey. And our soccer coach would just get so mad at us. Yeah. And so it just, you know, at that age, you kind of just had to pick. Yeah. And hockey is just what I went for. And then I think I always knew like I was, I was going to play college hockey. Like it wasn't a question. When anyone asked, like, oh, where do you want to go to school? It was like, well, I'm going to play hockey, so wherever hockey's going to take me. So let's keep climbing the ladder here. Um, it's state tournament time here in Minnesota. You know, I'm sure you guys had some pretty good teams and, you know, progress a little through youth here quick, and then uh, let's get to the high school. What happened there? Yeah, so our high school team – actually never made it to state. We lost in the section final every year and it was against Tonka. And the Tonka girls team back then was unbelievable. Um I think my freshman year they had Rachel Ramsey as a senior. Oh. Um, you know, like Sid Morin was a couple of years older than me and, you know, she was a gold medalist. And so they just had an unbelievable team. And I think they went three years where they were like three peats for the state tournament. Um, so I have a little bit of a hard time always when the state tournament comes around because we had a good team, but we only had a couple of superstars. And really Taylor and I, and there was about two girls above us that went D1. So I know everyone talks about you know, the Dinas, how good they are. But when it came to kind of Taylor and I's years, there was really only, you know, four that were went and played D1 hockey, where, you know, Tonka, I mean, they had, I think, eight. And even now they still have a good chunk, and so does Edina. But um, sadly, we never won state in high school. Well, you know, I I can sympathize with you a little bit, but uh, if you're not from Edina, I don't think you're going to get much sympathy from anyone <laughs> else. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. I was just I was just talking to I mean because like I said the state tournament's going on, and um, I was just talking to a kid about how just it's unbelievable how good Edina is all the time, and I had a year I was coaching Pee Wee's and I was coaching the Pee Wee Double A team, and all of, every player that I had. None of them signed up to as a as defense as their preferred position. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, you're the best athletes. We'll figure it out. So I, I every kid had to do like a three week rotation, and then I just told the parents that by the you know February we're gonna go with our tournament lineup, and yeah, we did, and we ended up making it to the state tournament. And my kids, uh, they played, they overachieved every one of them, and we played Edina. In the championship game, Jeff Johnson, any Dinah, yep. and you got thumped like eight to one or something like that. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, but it's this, it's amazing. And we're going to, I want to talk about that later. It's just amazing, um, just the consistency of that. So, all right. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't, um, you didn't win a state championship. You didn't get to, did you get, you didn't, did you get to the state tournament or you never even got to the no, state tournament? No, we were, we were back to back state winners in youth, but in high school, we always lost in the section final Ah, tough. and like overtime. Yeah. Well, that's something that we have to, together. I always got beat at Cooper high school by Minnetonka or stinking Edina. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, what let's, your career, I mean, obviously you're you're on the radar and you got colleges starting to creep around and, uh, you know, court you a little bit. Who were some of the colleges that uh, you 
were entertained by and then kind of walk us through your college career? Yeah, so I am probably not like a lot of Minnesota girls. I never really wanted to go to the U, which is funny since I ended up at the U. But (laughs) I, because I think I just knew everyone wanted to go there. And I was like, you know, I want to go somewhere different. Um, But I got looks from about every school in the WCHA and every school in Hockey East besides Providence. So I I was fortunate enough to kind of really decide what was best for me outside of hockey because my mom during this process really engraved to me that if you were to get hurt, you need to love the school that you are at because all of a sudden you're not playing hockey and you're there for school too. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, something that I constantly thought about. I also knew that I did not really want to go to a big school. I wanted to go to a smaller school and that was just, I wanted to meet, you know, other kids and the you to me, every time I was on campus always felt so big, but kind of once it came down to it, my real kind of handful picks was Wisconsin, North Dakota, Duluth, and then Merrimack was in that mix. And those were kind of the ones that I I weaned it down to when it came to kind of And were you going did you go on visits? During this whole time, is I mean, how, is that how you kind of got things to kind of whittle down? Yeah. So what what is really nice for girls hockey is they Winnie Bro puts on prospects where there's you know three weekends throughout the summer you're thrown on you know a random team with all Minnesota girls and college coaches come to that tournament and they coach you and every weekend you have different coaches. And you got two coaches. And so you really get to know the coaches throughout that weekend. And, cool. you know, I think that is huge too, because you really kind of get to know how they coach their personality, as well as them looking at you, how your body language is um, in between shifts. You know, how are you doing when, you know, you want to play with your friend and it gets switched up, all of those things. And then I was on white caps. And we would go to this tournament in Naha. And during that time is when we would fly out a couple of days early and go on to these visits. If they weren't, you know, from the Minnesota area is when my junior year, my dad and I flew out and we went to, you know, a ton of schools, some that I wasn't even talking to. And we just wanted to look at in case I was interested, like New Hampshire was one of them. And so that is really, I got great exposure due to kind of the prospects that Winnie did and being on Elite League and um, being on Whitecaps. I call her the godmother of women's hockey in Minnesota. If you're not yeah. somehow connected with her, you're, you need to be. Yeah. <laughs> Cause she's, yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you whittled it down and you already kind of told us, but you, you picked Merrimack. And uh, mm-hmm. let's start there because um, I think I read that that was their first year or did you have to go to school for a year and then the, the next year you played hockey? So it was their, it was their first year and I loved the campus. It was small. I really, I just really, when I stepped foot, I absolutely loved it. I liked that it was in Boston a lot, and it wasn't in the city. It was just outside of it, but close enough that you could go into the city if you wanted to. Sure. Um, Brent Hill at the time was the one that really recruited me, and the amount of time that he spent with my family and I, and that he was, you know, the U eighteen coach at the time, was also a big impact and was a huge factor for my decision. And I liked knowing that I would be able to come on and play right away. Um, Because you never know with, you know, these other teams that have a lot of the older girls, what your role is going to be. 
And I really wanted to jump in and make a big impact from the start. And, you know, that's kind of what happened. I got I got kind of lucky in a way that I was able as a freshman to come in and be on first line, be on power play, be on PK, and be almost like a go-to person playing against Boston College, you know, Boston University, North, you know, Northeastern, which has like Kendall Coyne. Um, yeah. It make it, it pushes you um, a lot. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed my time at Merrimack. Um, I ended up only a couple months in becoming a captain and, you know, I think looking back, if they were to ask me to do that again, I probably would have turned it down just because, you know, I was 17, 18 years old at the time. And I didn't quite, I definitely was not, um, ready for that responsibility. Um, you know, it had a lot of pros and cons to it. But they never they never hand you the the owner's manual and say, here's your, you know, yeah. <laughs> job requirements of being a captain. They just say, here, we're throwing yep. this on your jersey and go do your thing. Yeah. And it was me and a another girl that transferred from Duluth, who was a junior. Um, it was her and I. And of course, you know, she had way more experience. But all I had was, you know, high school captain. And that's way different from being you know, a D1 captain as a freshman. Uh, So I probably wasn't the best captain because, you know, I was just more like I was hard on them when they needed to be. But, you know, I'm sure it was also hard looking at a 17 year old and, you know, as a captain at the time. Right. right. Interesting. So did you guys um, that first year, did you make some noise? We did. We actually had a phenomenal first year. Our first game was against St. Cloud, and we lost to them in overtime. And then the next weekend, we beat New Hampshire. Um, You know, we never did well against Boston College. (laughs) They were so good at, you know, during those years. But we all really stepped in, and it was nice because a lot of girls that were recruited from Merrimack were from Minnesota. So I knew a good amount yeah. that was going there. So we already had a little bit of chemistry, which made it a lot easier. And I do think Minnesota players have a, a different style of playing versus out east. And, you know, we we really meshed and really put our name on the map, map from the start, which was awesome. All right, so you you have a solid first year, but then are you back there year two because there's some time that you moved back to Minnesota? Yeah, so I was there. I was there for a second year, and then as I'm starting to look at careers at the time, it was actually kind of funny. The Merrimack coach is the one that told me, "Oh, you should look into being a speech pathologist." And I, at the time, I had no idea what that was really. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll I'll do some, you know, digging into it and look into it. And I decided, okay, that might be something that I want to pursue. And in order to be a speech pathologist, you have to have a certain undergrad degree because you have to go on to grad school after. And Merrimack did not have that undergrad. And so once I came home from winter break and I was talking to my family and there's kind of some other factors to it. I, you know, I, I, again, I didn't really, it was, it was very hard being, you know, a captain, having a lot of the girls be your age and not having really kind of that hierarchy of, you know, seniors and all of that. And so my dad, you know, kind of sat me down and throughout my whole second year, he was like, you could always transfer, you can always transfer. And so when I went home for winter break, I was like, you know, I'm going to start looking at schools that have speech pathology as their undergrad. And so from there, I narrowed it down to three schools um, that I would be interested in playing hockey. And once our season 
ended. I went into the coaches, you know, asked for my release. And, you know, that was a really tough conversation. Um, and probably not a day that, you know, I want to live through again. Right, right. And again, um, you're still, you're 18, 19 years old. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they, um, the head coach took it, I think, pretty rough. But, you know, the assistants were kind of like, okay, like, we understand. So after I got my release, you know, I started reaching out to other colleges and I reached out to Winnie Broat and let her know, hey, I want to transfer. Um, and my schools were Penn State, Minnesota and Ohio State. And so now I'm jumping into, you know, bigger schools than what I'm at. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you know, this is what I know I want to do. And so I reached out to Frosty, who, I mean, this was by far the best decision of my life so far. I could not have been happier, you know, with how this all played out. But I am home for spring break. And Frosty was like, hey, do you want to, you know, come for a visit? And I'm like, sure. So my dad and I went and my dad already knew Cal Dietz. Um, who's the strength coach at the U, you know, because of he helped my brother through all of that time. And so as Frosty's taking us through the tour, he's saying, oh, you would live over here. And when we get into the strength room and talk to Cal, Cal's like, oh, you know, when can I start giving her a workout plan? And I'm kind of my dad and I are looking at each other like, <laughs> wow, OK. And after the visit you know we go and get pot belly head back to his office and he's like so you you can sign here and i'm like oh full and court, i, I, full court I got, press. yeah i kind of like freeze and panic and so i just sign it and i'm like okay and he's like okay welcome and i was like <laughs> okay and I call my mom after and I'm like, so I guess, you know, I'm going to the Gophers. And she's like, what? Because it just, <laughs> it happened so fast. And, you know, but I'm I'm so blessed that it did happen the way it did. Because um, I could not have been happier with my experience at the U. So you, you alluded to it that you're coming now to a bigger school. And, um, you know, what happened then? Did you have similar opportunity or... Like a lot of players, you know, you you had the uncommon path where, you know, you play high school, you're the stud, and all of a sudden your first year playing college hockey, you get the first line, first power play. And normally, mm -hmm. you know, players have to wait a couple of years before that opportunity comes in. What happened when you moved over to the U from a playing and opportunity standpoint? Yeah, well, I mean, it was drastically different. Um and it's drastically different from how they practice to how they train. Almost everything is just completely different. And I'm not a very shy person, but those first couple of weeks, um, I really just kind of like kept my head down and did what I was told. Um, and I mean, the you girls were extremely welcoming. I knew a lot, obviously, from, you know, majority are from Minnesota as well. So growing up and playing from, but it was, it was a battle. I mean, every day at practice is a battle and you are working for a spot, you're training for a spot. And me walking in, they kind of already had their spot set. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then they're recruiting top of the top kids. So I mean, those freshmen, they're, you know, third, fourth line, even though if they went anywhere else, they might be, you know, first and second line. Right. So it was it was definitely different. But I think what was different for me is I played so much at Merrimack and I got that exposure that when I came to the U, I was just happy to really be on a team and still playing the sport that I love. Um, and I think as you get older too, throughout your college, you start to just 
be grateful versus a freshman, it's almost like do or die. Yeah. You know, like I was okay being third and fourth line and all of that because a I I, I knew my role. You know, I was like, there's kids on the that just came back from the Olympic team. You know, like right. they're they just won. You know, Kelly Panic just won a gold medal. She's she deserves to be on that first line and how the U for the girls has their culture set is that you really understand your role. Everyone buys into their role and they just did a great job no matter what line you are, making you feel included and still such a huge part of the team. And so obviously I I worked my butt off no matter what and I was always trying to reach for, you know, a higher line and more playing time. But I also knew like, okay, if that, you know, doesn't happen, how can I still help this team? Because we're, we have a chance to go to the frozen four and, you know, there's a border battle coming up. That's, that's what's more important is like the team win versus kind of your individual success. We're at Merrimack. It's a little, it was a little bit different just do being a new team having all freshmen you the lines didn't really change you know yeah so it was it was a big adjustment but i also when i was looking at new schools it was when north dakota's team got cut so i was also just grateful that frosty you know decided to take me as the transfer versus a north dakota girl because they're all looking for spots right and so it was a little bit of a panic too of yeah there's a lot more people in the transfer portal right now um they're allowed you know to go to any school that they want but you know i'm again i'm so grateful for frosty and the whole gopher staff that they took a chance on me and i wouldn't trade my experience for the world did you get to the big dance and did you win one so my i mean we usually always make it to the frozen four and we lost in the championship game to Wisconsin my senior year. Gut shot. Oh, it, yeah. I, it was the absolute heartbreaker. Um, especially losing to Wisconsin. <laughs> was that, uh, was Presley Norby and Sophie Shaver on that team? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And we were going back all year because that year we won, you know, we were regular season champs. They were second in the WCHA. Um, both Wisconsin and us didn't even, you know, win the WCHA. Then all of a sudden we end up playing each other in the championship for Frozen Four. And we went one and two throughout the whole year against each other. I mean, that was by far our biggest competition. And we would just constantly be up and down and it was just us two. So we knew that, you know, there was a high chance we were going to end up playing them. And it is, it stings to this day and for sure a day I'll never forget because it's just gut wrenching. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, that, and then the high school tournament, I, because I trained so many players and all the state tournaments, you know, I got some that, are real happy and others that aren't, but uh, we just reset and go on to the next thing. So, yeah. did you have, uh, did you play pro for any time after college? So, I decided not to because I was going to go to grad school. And for all of the pros at that time, it would never have been able to work out for being able to you know, go on and play, sadly. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think now with how it would, I would have probably put off grad school, but, you know, that's okay. I, I'm i still extremely thankful and happy with my career, and I was beyond blessed, you know, with all that I got to experience, like, you know, going to the Frozen Four and all of that multiple yeah. times. Awesome. So let's transition. You have, uh, we talked about it in the introduction, but let's talk about your brother, Duke. Uh, when did, you know, 
when did that whole uh, situation happen? And just kind of walk us through, uh, you know, the challenge your family had to go through. Yeah, so I was in seventh grade when it really all started. And so kind of going from the beginning, they found out that my brother had a blood clot in his brain stem. And the doctors at the time told my parents, he has to live his life. We don't know really how that's going to look and what can happen. So my brother, he was the hockey star. He was like really the star athlete of our family. He was the one that was like super good. And for those years and knowing kind of that he has a blood clot in his brainstem and who knows what's going to happen in the future, my parents decided to send him to Shattuck because that is what he wanted. And so for two years of um, my life, my, you know, kind of seventh and eighth grade year, my brother and one of my parents lived in a townhouse at Shattuck. And they would kind of rotate. Um, And, you know, that was kind of hard because, you know, I'm kind of getting shuffled around a little bit. Um, But I knew that is what was best for Duke and he was happy. And there was a point that I actually, I had a choice to either go to Shattuck or stay. I tried out for the Shattuck team, you know, made it. And I decided, like, nope, I'm I'm still going to stay. And that actually I'm extremely grateful for because that year when I decided that I was going to stay, my brother wanted to come home to Edina, and he wanted to make it to the state tournament. So cool. my brother went to Hill Murray and as a freshman made varsity and in his first varsity game during warmups he started to see double vision and his head started to hurt and he told his coach and his coach was like oh you know jitters you're a freshman you're the only freshman on the team right now like you know you'll be okay and duke Did was he, like no was some well, sorry for interrupting, but yeah. was his was his condition communicated like to the to the Shattuck coaches and stuff like that? Or, or yeah, just... it was communicated, but there was really nothing. You know, he if you looked at him, he was a completely normal kid. He did everything. You would never know he had a blood clot because it wasn't pressing on any of the nerves at the time. And you know, so I I know my parents told kind of the coaches. I don't really know how in depth or anything like that, but my brother pulled himself from that game. And it was funny because it was on TV for some reason. That first Till Murray game was on TV and I'm in the Braemar lobby looking up because I just was about to go to practice and I'm like laughing. So I'm like, ha Duke hasn't like touched the ice yet, you know, because we, him and I were very competitive with one another And yet to know he pulled himself from the game because he knew something was off with his head. And so the next morning, my mom wakes me up and was like, hey, like Duke has, he had check-ins and every six months would get an MRI. And so my mom was like, you know, do you want to skip school in the morning and come with us to Duke's appointment? We'll get breakfast after, you know, like just a total normal day. Um, and I was like, yeah, for sure. You know, we thought everything was fine. It was Duke more just like being nervous, but he just happened to have a check-in the next day and we get there. He has the MRI and the doctors came in and was like, he needs immediate surgery. His blood clots bleeding in his brain. And I, I was still, I mean, I was young at the time, so I don't really know what's going on. And, you know, they tell him he has a 5% chance of living, you know, through the surgery because it's a very rare, you know, condition that happened. And Duke's looking at my dad like, am I going to die? And I'm like breaking down crying. I run to the bathroom like, 
it was a complete (laughs) like 180 from what we thought our day was going to be like. And so my uncle comes and picks me up. My parents stay at the hospital and he has like over a 14 hour surgery. Um, and from that surgery, they removed the blood clot, but they damaged all of his nerves and his brain. And he was left open on the table for so long that he got an infection. Um, so he was in the ICU for almost a year. He was paralyzed, whole body besides his eyes. Um, and at this point he was, I believe, 16. Um, and so, I mean, he, he had, you know, chunks of his brain is gone because the infection has never gone away even to this day. Um, and he's, I mean, he's had multiple surgeries in and out of the hospital. He has, you know, an incredible story. And throughout that time, you know, I'm, I'm don't quite understand you know, like I'm I'm young. Um, all I know is really, you know, my brother's in the hospital. There were days where we spent all the holidays in the hospital. Um, you know, there were days my my parents, you know, didn't even know where I was. <laughs> you know, and I'm thankful for the Williamsons and the Andersons who let me stay at their house for a week straight. You know, yeah. and kind of raised me a little bit there. Um, just from all that, you know, my family was going through at the time. Yeah. Wow. Holy cow. Okay. Well, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so once um, he uh, was, there was a point there where none of the doctors really think he would make it. And, you know, that's My hard for picks. you. That's hard. How, how was that like for you, you know, to understand that as a young kid, like, holy cow. Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I, I still didn't quite understand it. You know, like I, I knew he isn't doing well, but I, not to that extent, you know, I'm still looking at like the brother that I had, you know, and who I grew up with. And that's obviously not the brother I have now, just from all that has happened and what he went through. But it definitely, you know, has really made me the person I am today because of all that I went through at a young age. <laughs> um, but I for sure handled it a different way. I really tried to block it out, you know, like I, I still played hockey. I you know, was living with my friends. I really acted like nothing was going on in my life. Yeah. Um, and I think it made me love hockey even more just because it gave, it gave me a couple hours of no one's talking to me about it, you know, because there's yeah. days where my mom would be like, you know, they don't think Duke's going to make it. You know, we should really go see him tonight. And I didn't want to because I didn't want to miss practice. And, you yeah. know, I didn't really want to believe that, you know, I wasn't going to have a brother. Um, but it definitely it definitely had a strong in- impact. But, you know, it's still an experience that I think has made me the person I am today. And I'm a lot stronger from it because of the things that, you know, I had to go through. Um, and hockey was definitely an escape for a bit and you know i know my parents <laughs> tried their absolute best um and i never resented them for not being there for a lot of those years when it came just because they had so much more going on and i yeah. understood that yeah so where where is duke you know how is he doing today yeah so um he still sees double vision that never came back. He uh, half of his face is paralyzed. Um that didn't come back. And you know, he with how many times he 
went under and had surgery, there are, you know, parts of his brain that are gone. Yeah. Um, and, but he's, you know, doing, doing well. He's, um, you know, we're just thankful that he's here with us. Um, but life, life definitely is a lot different for him. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just thankful that he's here and that, you know, he has still been able to have somewhat of a normal life, but I know for him, it was not easy seeing me go off and play college hockey, um, and kind of live out his dream. So there was a little animosity there a little bit for it, which I totally understand, but, um, I know it wasn't easy for him to kind of watch me play hockey and, you know, go on and play college hockey and have the experience that he for sure wanted. And do you think, I mean, because there's um, the Piper Foundation, uh, the Piper Hope and Courage Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. He wrote a book mm -hmm. called I'm Alive. Um, I'm sure that had to help in you know, a little bit of the healing process and maybe getting over some of that animosity that, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, I'll, make, definitely. I'll make sure I put that in, in, the, in the description. Um, anything else that you want to add about the book? That's pretty cool. Yeah, no. Um, I honestly, I personally have not been able to get myself to read the book. <laughs> mm. Um, just because I'm like, you know, I kind of lived through it, mm -hmm. but I'm extremely proud of him for, you know, sharing his story and being able to come to a place to talk about it and to help others, um, you know, that have gone through similar situations and just to, you know, really, and I know everyone says this, but play like it's your last, you know, because you never know what can happen. And for the kids and players that are out there playing hockey, don't take it for granted. Um, so, yeah. Well, uh, definitely an inspiration um, uh, of courage and just overcoming uh, a shitty situation, that's for sure. So yeah. I'm glad he's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're we're right around the hour mark. Uh, I got a few more quick questions for you, if that if you're okay with that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, real quickly, what is a speech pathologist for <laughs> lis listeners? Because you know we we're like you right now. You didn't know what it was at one point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a speech language pathologist can either work with adults or kids, and I work with adults, and so I work with um, individuals who have had strokes, um, traumatic brain injuries, Parkinson's, you know, that kind of huge field, and it's a very broad range, but I work on their swallowing and their feeding. Um I work on, you know, if they have Alzheimer's or dementia, I work on their cognition. We work on attention, word finding. So it's kind of, it's it's a very, really broad range when it comes to adults. Yeah. Um, for kids, you know, you work with um, patients that may be nonverbal or artistic who have a lisp and just working on their speaking, their language. Um, yeah, so it's a very it's a very broad a broad range of things that we can work on um with patients. So it's kind of hard to give a specific example, but you know, we just work on their feeding, swallowing, talking, and you know, all things to do with their brain and their throat. Improving their quality of life. I just what popped into my head is just all the time I spent with, you know, the athletic trainer, physical therapist, you know. Uh, the chiropractor and you know you're helping people and mm -hmm. you know that's that's awesome so uh continued success with that um yes. you also 
uh, you, you coached some uh, through the years here. Now you're currently just doing uh, small group uh, skill stuff on the ice. So my question to you is, after an ice session, what do you want the kid to say to their parents in the car ride, ride home? Um, you know, when the mom or dad asks, you know, how was your time with Coach Piper? That they learned something that, you know, they learned something that they did not know beforehand, whether it was, you know, how your hips need to rotate when you're doing crossovers or, you know, where your hand should be placed when you shoot. Anything like that is that they actually take away something that they learned and can then, when they go to practice, be able to implement that, you know, how your stride should look and how you need to be your full blade and then your toe. Um, all of those little things, you know, that you don't really get in a big group setting is those fine technique points that do matter down the road. Because if you want to play college hockey, you got to be able to be good on your skates. You know, yeah. you got to be able to have those edges, a stride, power. And you don't get that unless you really work with a skating coach. Yeah. There's this, there's this so much as a, a youth coach, you know, to go over the, you know, the, the, the technical things, so many of those, but then the tactical things. And, and then if you mm -hmm. don't have a lot of experience, um, you know, it can really expose holes in, in someone's, but you know, it is a lot. So, uh, thanks for what you're doing. That is awesome. My last question, uh, is that I've been trying youth hockey associations, around the state of Minnesota have been trying to solve something that they can't. And that's, uh, you know, I looked at all the state tournaments that were going on at every mm -hmm. level. And guess what? There's a, a green and yellow and white team in almost every <laughs> level. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I remember in YZ, you know, the board would spend time or coach player development. And they, how can, how can, what are they doing over there? that we're not doing. <laughs> so how is it that Edina is this consistently always in a thorn in everyone's side? Um, I really think it is from what those youth coaches do. And they're not so much just trying to make one individual better. They're trying to make the whole team better. And it's not just regroups cycles, you know, they really take the time to teach a kid how to play defense, how to deke all of those little things that matter when you're in youth. And so then once they get to that high school level, you're not teaching them how to block a shot. You know, they should already know that. And I think that that's, you know, a big thing. Take the time to teach the youth kids, the little things. So then when they're in high school, that high school coach does not have to teach them things that they feel they already should know. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Jackie, first, let me thank you for taking the time and sharing your hockey journey with me and the listeners. Yeah. Uh, it was awesome. Second, congratulations on a great hockey career. And finally, thank you. Yeah, thank you for continuing trying to improve the game, but most importantly, it's how you're helping others, hockey connected or not, supporting them in every aspect of their life to give, I guess, each individual the best opportunity to succeed. You know, if there's anything that I can do to help in what you have going on, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for sharing your hockey journey. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Well, that concludes another awesome episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing the hockey journey of Jackie Piper and what a journey it was. If any of you young hockey hopefuls are looking for a mentor, someone to look up to or learn from, Jackie is someone I would highly recommend. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, Please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.